Folks, welcome back to another episode of The Fallen Badge. Today, the murder of Officer Sean Collier, Massachusetts Institute of Technology Police Department. Now, Officer Collier was 26 years old. He had about 15 months on with the MIT police. Now, his mom and daddy were still alive, and he had five siblings. Now, our episode today is actually going to be three parts to it, in effect. We're going to have the Boston Marathon bombing, and these same suspects are going to assassinate Officer Collier, and they're going to commit a carjacking. That carjacking's going to lead to a shoot out with the police where one of the suspects is going to be shot and killed and the second suspect in prison. Now it's April 15th, 2013. It's the 117th annual Boston Marathon. It's being run on Patriots Day. Now our two suspects who are in this country along with their family because it's safer here in the country they came from they decided they don't like Americans. And that can be traced back to their religious upbringing. Now they decided that since American troops are in Iraq and Afghanistan, they're going to go down to the Boston Marathon and murder innocent men, women, and children. So they got online and they were able to concoct some homemade explosive devices. Now, what they're going to use at the marathon are two homemade pressure cooker bombs. They go down to the race. They've got the bombs and backpacks. Now, they get down there near the finish line. One of the suspects, he sets his backpack down right there around 671 and 673 Boylston Street, right there near the Marathon Sports Store. Second suspect, he sets his backpack down at 755 Boston Street. That's just about a block and a half or so down the street. Now both these bombs are laying out on the sidewalk and there are large crowds standing on the sidewalk watching the runners come in. First bomb goes off at 2.49 and 43 seconds in the evening. Second device goes off at 2.49 and 57. Now the explosions killed and maimed a good many people. Blew out windows and businesses. You still had runners coming down the street. Now Boston police were able to divert the runners because they had a backup plan in case there ever was an incident that required them to reroute the runner, so they put that into effect. Now the police closed off a 15 block area around the blast sites and within that 15 blocks there was a 12 block crime scene. Now the evidence they recovered at the scene included bits of metal, nails, ball bearings, black nylon pieces of a backpack, remains of an electronic circuit board and wiring. They also recovered a pressure cooker lid from a rooftop nearby. Now the site they went to to make these bombs was one of a known terrorist group. Three people had died. There were hundreds injured. Seventeen individuals who survived lost a limb. Now at some point, pictures of the suspects were released to the media. Now there had been kind of a brouhaha between the Boston Police Department and the FBI over whether to release the pictures. My understanding is Boston PD wanted the pictures put out and the FBI didn't, each for different reasons. Now, as it turns out, one of the pictures of one of the bombers was leaked to a news outlet in Boston. And after that occurred, the FBI went on to release all the pictures they had. Now, it's interesting to note that Friends and classmates of these suspects saw those still images and video. 
and several of them recognized who they were or who they believed them to be. They never called the Boston police and they never called the FBI. I believe there would be some individuals being sent back to their country of origin and their visas canceled. Three nights later, April 18th, 2013, now the chief of the MIT police, he's heading home for the evening. It's about 9.35 or so. Now as he's leaving, he sees Officer Collier. Officer Collier sitting in his cruiser there around Vassar and Main Street. And he pulls over there and he talks to him for a few minutes. And then he goes home. Now, the particular area that Officer Collier was assigned was known as the North Quad. Now, that area is right around Maine and Vassar. So now, somewhere around 10.20 p.m., someone calls 911, speaks to the dispatcher there at MIT, says he heard loud noises outside his window. Caller told the dispatcher it didn't exactly sound like gunshots, but he wasn't for sure. So the dispatcher, he calls Officer Collier on the radio. He doesn't get a response. He sends an emergency alert. Still nothing. Then he tries to text him. He doesn't get a response to that. Dispatcher later would say that, that amount of time going by, he started to feel very uncomfortable. Now, the sergeant had just come into the station. He's getting ready to go home. Now, he heard about Officer Collier not answer his radio, and he said, well, I just passed him coming in. He's sitting over in his cruiser at Vassar in Maine. So he told the dispatcher, I'll go back out there and see if he's still there. So he pulls up, and in the video, you can see the nose of his car to the left of Officer Collier's squad car. Now, the sergeant said he parked about 8 to 10 meters away from Officer Collier's vehicle. He walks over to the car and he looks in. He sees that Officer Collier has suffered some head wounds. Also looks like he's got wounds to the neck and to his hand. So the sergeant, he puts out the officer down call and he calls for an ambulance. They get Officer Collier out and they're trying to resuscitate him. Officers on the scene said that Officer Collier was just covered in blood. Now they pull the cameras they start looking at the video and they see the two suspects come around behind the building towards Officer Collier's vehicle. Now I believe the suspects were riding around because they needed another pistol so they were targeting a police officer. And I believe they saw Officer Collier sitting in his squad car. I believe they went through the intersection, went around there and parked on Ames Street and then walked around the building. So one of the two suspects, these brothers, he shot Officer Collier three times. Now he could not get his pistol out of his holster and I guess he didn't want to take the time to try to, to get the gun belt off the officer. Now about that time somebody rides by on a bicycle and it startles the suspect at the door of Officer Collier's vehicle. So then the suspect just turns and leaves without the pistol on him and his brother. They begin running and then they start walking fast around the back of the building, go back on Ames Street, getting their green Honda and they take off. Now Officer Collier was dead when he arrived at the hospital. The ME would later testify that she could not determine the order of the gunshots, but she said that the damage done from the three gunshots to the head were too grievous for anyone to recover from, that Officer Collier would have had no purposeful movements. He was essentially dead right away. Now, according to the ME, she said that one gunshot wound struck Officer Collier between the eyes and that that gunshot came from about one foot away from his face. Said two other shots to Officer Collier's head were close contact wounds. Now close contact would be less than two foot. Now they started pulling that video up. They were able to watch the suspects on video. They also got video 
watching a green Honda leaving down Ames Street in a hurry. Now they recovered shell casings, and those shell casings were 9 millimeter. Now later that same evening, poor fella just left work, and it's somewhere around 10.30 at night. Now he's driving a 2013 Mercedes-Benz SUV. He drives along Memorial Drive in Cambridge, and then he crosses the Boston University Bridge, and then he heads into the neighborhood of Austin. Now, he gets a text, and being a safe driver he is, instead of answering it while he's driving, he pulls over to the curb and starts texting back. said he noticed the car pull up behind him real fast and saw somebody walking up to the passenger side window of his vehicle. Now, he thinks that somebody won't ask for direction, so he puts the window down. Subject sticks a gun in his face and asks for money. So the victim, he hands over his wallet. Suspect asks the victim, do you know about the Boston Marathon explosion? The victim says, yep. He goes, you know who did it? He goes, nope. He says, I did it, and I just killed a policeman in Cambridge. So then the suspect, he tells Ming to drive into Watertown, tells him to pull up on Dexter Street. So they pull on Dexter Street and stop in a Vehicle pulls up behind them. Suspect tells the victim to get in the passenger seat. So the suspect, he takes over driving. Second suspect, he walks up from the green Honda and he gets in the back seat. Uh, They drive around about 10 or 15 minutes. They tell the victim to stop at a Bank of America on Main Street in Watertown. They use the victim's ATM card and get out $800. Now they ask the victim, they go, can this car go out of state like New York? Now the reason they're asking that is they're from a European country and the area they're from, you can't necessarily just travel about freely. So of course the victim looks at him and goes, well, yeah, you can travel out of state. You can go to New York. Now they ask him, they go, does your vehicle have GPS? And this is when the victim decides, well, it's time to start lying. He says, no, it doesn't have GPS. So now they head over to the a Shell gas station to get some gas. One suspect stays in the driver's seat, and the other one gets out of the back seat, and he goes in. Because not only do they need gas, but they got to get some snacks, because it's going to be a long drive to New York. Now, the victim sitting in the passenger seat, front passenger seat, he has decided that he's never going to see New York, that they're going to execute him as soon as they get him out away from civilization, which is a very good thing to be thinking. So he decides, well, I might as well go and make a break for it now. And he did the right thing because it's sure better to get shot out there in the middle of a street people around than it is to be executed out on the side of the road somewhere in the middle of nowhere. So he drops his seatbelt and throws open the door and takes off running. The suspect almost grabs him by the arm but can't quite get him. So the victim runs across to the mobile station across the street. He tells the clerk to call the police. Says the guys out there, they got a gun. They're the ones that set off the bombs at the Boston Marathon. So finally the clerk, he calls the police. The victim gets on the phone and provides all the information he knows. Well, they send Cambridge officers over there to the scene. Now, it doesn't state in here whether he actually told them, said, hey, look, he admitted to killing an officer in Cambridge. Now, of course, the time the police get there, the suspects are long gone because as soon as the victim got across the street, first suspect ran in and hollered at the second suspect. They ran back to the Mercedes and they took off. So now the police find out that the Mercedes has a tracking system. It's called Embrace. So the supervisor of communications, he calls Mercedes Benz. Well, they start pinging the car. Uh, It takes a couple of minutes, but they find the cars over on 87 Dexter Street in Watertown. Now, of course, that's where they've got their Honda parked at. So they 
holler up at Watertown Police and tell them he's a carjacking suspects and the vehicle. It's over there on Dexter. Now, from the resource material, it doesn't look like they told the officers in Watertown that, hey, by the way, these guys are have possibly set off the bombs at the Boston Marathon and they, they bragged about killing a police officer in Cambridge, which we think is going to be that MIT officer, Officer Collier. That information didn't get passed along. So Watertown police pull up, and there's the suspect sitting. So then we have a shootout. Now only one of the suspects has got a pistol. He's cranking off rounds at the police, and the police are shooting back. The other suspect, he doesn't have a gun, so he's throwing pipe bombs, and he's got one more pressure cooker bomb, and he's throwing that. And the police are hollering for help. Now, the one suspect, the older of the two, he's hit multiple times by police gunfire. Somewhere in the resource material, I, I can't remember if it said he got hit eight times or 12 times, but they had shot him to pieces. So he goes after the police, literally, so they tackle him and they're fighting him. He's been all shot up and he's still fighting. Now the second suspect, he runs. He gets back in the Mercedes SUV and he's going to run over all the police officers. Well now the police officers, they duck out of the way and the suspect runs over his own brother. And drags him along the street there for a little bit. Now doctors would later say that the injury sustained from being run over probably contributed to the suspect's death I would would imagine so and the suspect's pronounced dead at 1.35 a.m. traumatic injuries to the head and torso now the FBI gets over there and they've got their handy dandy fingerprint machine that they've got they're able to put his fingers on that screen and they get an instantaneous hit on who he is. And of course, from that, it doesn't take long to figure out the second suspect's his brother. So they can pull up the image they've got in their files, and it matches the pictures from the bombers. Now, the second suspect, the uh, one that's made his escape, now he drops the car off over there around Spruce and Lincoln, and he runs south southwest. He goes over there and he there's a boat parked in a driveway on Franklin. It's got the cover over it, so he slips up underneath the cover and hides in the boat. Now there's a shelter-in-place order. Everybody's been following it. Well, they finally lift the order. The fella goes out to check on his boat, and he sees the blood, and he actually peeks underneath and sees the guy hiding in there, our suspect. So he calls 911 police get over there and they surround the boat because pretty well everybody with a badge and a gun anywhere from 100 miles of Boston is looking for this second suspect. So they get the boat surrounded. Well, somebody sees the suspect stick a hand out from the cover of the boat. Now, he believes the suspect's getting ready to throw a pipe bomb. So he fires around at the suspect. Well, then all the rest of the police, which is probably a hundred or so at least, they all start firing. Now the police put a couple of hundred rounds into the boat. Some of those rounds happen to go through some houses as well. Thank God they didn't hit any civilians. They get all the firing stopped. Well, the suspect won't come out, so they, they bring their armored car in with their attachment on the front, and they rip the tarp off of the boat. Suspect still won't come out, so they start throwing flashbangs in there and tear gas. And finally, the suspect hollers uncle, so he comes out. Well, of course, they tell him to raise his shirt because police are convinced that he's got a, a bomb vest on, a suicide vest. But after he raises his shirt and they see he looks like he doesn't have anything on him, they take him into custody. Now, they question the suspect and... He tells them about how him and his brother are against America for being in Iraq and Afghanistan. Tells them how they learned to make the bombs out of that online site. And he said, yeah, we were going to New York, we were going to bomb Times Square. 
Now, the suspect, he gets convicted of 30 charges, including use of a weapon of mass destruction and malicious destruction of property, resulting in death. Now, he's sentenced to death. Now, the case goes up to the United States Court of Appeals, First Circuit, and they decide the death penalty is just too cruel. So they vacate the order for the death sentence. Well, it gets appealed to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, they make the decision that the lower court erred in their decision, that they should have not vacated that death sentence. So they reinstate the death sentence. As far as I know, the suspect still sits at United States prison there in Florence, Colorado, the supermax, awaiting his death sentence to be carried out. And if anybody ever deserved a death sentence, this suspect does. Officer Sean Allen Collier. End of watch, April 18th, 2013.